John Willis, the white Chinese mafia boss. One morning in Dorchester, Massachusetts, John Willis Jr. celebrated his girlfriend's daughter, Mei Lin's ninth birthday after returning from Florida. As a notorious gangster in Asian organized crime, he rose to become the first white man to achieve such a status. Despite his unconventional means, Willis found belonging and family with his girlfriend and Mei Lin. He was a kingpin in the oxycodone trade, trafficking over 260,000 pills from Florida to the Northeast in less than two years for profits of over $4 million. However, he blew his wealth on extravagant items such as oceanfront homes, sports cars, strip clubs, speedboats, and earned a reputation as a dangerous, violent man. In the seedy underworld of Asian organized crime, a white man rose to the top to become the notorious kingpin of one of the most extensive drug operations in Northeast America. John Willis, also known as Bak Gwai John, or the White Devil, muscled his way up through the ranks to lead a vast conspiracy trafficking in oxycodone, the pharmaceutical heroin responsible for countless deaths across the country. In this video, let us explore Willis, a former hockey-playing Catholic kid from a working-class Boston neighborhood, and how he became a Chinatown overlord, leaving a trail of destruction and devastation in his wake. It's an understatement to say that Willis had a difficult childhood. He was born in 1971 in the neighborhood of Dorchester in Boston, where he was one of the few white Irish children in the area. His father was a carpenter who struggled with alcoholism and abusive behavior and also collected money for the Irish mob. One fateful night, his father's association with the mob led to trouble when he broke the jaw of one of its members. Fearing for his life, he left his wife and three-year-old son Willis behind and fled to his home state of North Carolina. This left Willis without a father figure from a young age and without the support of a stable home environment. After being abandoned by his father, Willis harbored a deep-seated anger which he often channeled into playing hockey. However, his anger occasionally overpowered him. For example, he attacked another child with a chair, suspecting him of stealing his trainers. This act of violence resulted in his expulsion and transfer to an alternative school. In another instance, a girl kicked him and Willis reacted by spitting on her. His half-brother intervened and pushed him down a flight of stairs. In his rage, Willis screamed at his half-brother and expressed a wish for his death. Tragically, just two days later, his half-brother passed away due to a heart attack caused by cocaine use. Willis was devastated and believed that his outburst caused his brother's death. Willis's life took a turn for the worse as tragedy continued to strike. At the age of 13, his mother had both her legs amputated due to complications from diabetes and he took on the role of her caregiver. However, his struggles were far from over. Sadly, when he was just 14 years old, his mother passed away suddenly from a blockage in her heart, leaving him all alone in the world. His only remaining family were his two half-sisters, but their struggles with drug addiction meant they were unable to provide support. Refusing to accept charity, Willis found himself living in his deceased brother's freezing home with no money to buy food or heat. The hardships he faced only added to the seething anger he had been carrying since childhood. He claimed that his mother's death forced him to mature overnight, but the truth was that he was left feeling like a cold, scared, and hungry child. In an attempt to defend himself and gain strength, he turned to weightlifting and steroid use, transforming himself into a hulking teenager seething with anger. At the age of 16, he looked like a grown man, which he used to his advantage in landing a job as a bouncer near Fenway Park. Despite being warned to stay away from the Asian community who were known to be involved in organized crime, he found himself in the middle of a fight one night during the altercation. A Chinese man was maced in the face, prompting Willis to step in and break it up. He punched the attacker and led the victim, later revealed to be vaping Joe, to the restroom to wash out his eyes. The young gangster was grateful for Willis's intervention, which marked the beginning of an unlikely alliance. Willis was left with only 76 cents and desperately needed food or shelter. He went to his half-sister's house for help, but she didn't answer the door, leaving him in the freezing cold. He then called the number on Vaping Joe's card, and to his surprise, two BMWs with impeccably dressed Asian men arrived on the scene, and he bravely climbed into the car. 
The group soon pulled up to a grand house that belonged to the notorious Ping On Gang, a notorious Asian criminal organization known for running illegal gambling dens and massage parlors throughout Boston. Inside the house, Willis was greeted by a crowd of people of all ages and genders, making the young man feel somewhat out of place. Amidst his desperation and destitution, Willis never would have imagined that he would be given the royal treatment. The members of the Ping On gang welcomed him with open arms, feeding him a warm meal and giving him $500 in cash. They even provided him with a bed for the night, a luxury he hadn't experienced in ages. But that was only the beginning of their generosity. They took him on a shopping spree, discarding his old clothes and fitting him in custom suits. They even provided him with a pager and a brick-sized cell phone. To complete the transformation, they styled his hair into the Ping On's iconic spiky look. Willis was stunned by the gang's hospitality. He'd grown up neglected, sleeping on cold floors to survive, and here he was, welcomed like a long-lost relative by people he'd only met days before. So when they offered him the opportunity to train with the Hung Mun, a gang faction affiliated with Ping On, he accepted without hesitation. After dropping out of school, John Willis headed to New York's Chinatown, where he struggled to adapt to a new culture and language. Despite the challenges, Willis quickly became a quick learner, picking up Cantonese, Toysanese, and Vietnamese. He also learned cultural customs, such as showing respect to elders and using chopsticks. Willis even used his newly acquired language skills to impress girls at a karaoke bar. Along with learning tea pouring and karaoke songs, Willis also learned how to use a gun, which he practiced in a slaughterhouse. Although his first attempt at robbery failed when he faced gunfire in a sweatshop, Willis continued working for the Lao brothers in Chinatown. Willis became more determined and gained a reputation as a violent and steroid-using white guy from Boston in Chinatown. He caused chaos by destroying a restaurant after the owner criticized him in Cantonese. In another incident, he and his crew chopped off a man's hand with a machete to get his cash-filled briefcase, which was cuffed to his wrist. Willis earned a reputation and the nickname Back Guy John, which meant White Devil John, after spending two years in New York. He earned respect and fear from others. In 1990, he was summoned back to Boston to work for Bike Ming, a gambling den kingpin with dangerous enemies who used Molotov cocktails as weapons. As Ming wasn't a high-ranking member of the Chinatown gangsters, Willis respected him and worked diligently as his right-hand man. Willis's job was to ensure Ming's safety by pouring his tea, checking his car for bombs, and even accompanying him to the bathroom. Ming became Willis's mentor and father figure, instilling in him the importance of respect, restraint, and the dangers of drugs, which brought too much heat. In Boston, gang violence was a regular occurrence, and one night while outside a gambling den, John Willis witnessed the assassination of a high-ranking gang leader by a lone gunman. Despite being targeted himself, the shooter's gun malfunctioned, leaving Willis unharmed. As the gang war intensified, many top leaders either fled or were killed. However, Ming emerged as the top gangster in Boston, with Willis as his right-hand man. Willis engaged in assault, which resulted in him being sent to jail multiple times during his time as Ming's enforcer. While in jail, he met people involved in drug dealing, something that was forbidden by his gang and made his boss unhappy. Despite this, Willis saw the potential for profit and began selling marijuana in small quantities before moving on to larger amounts of marijuana and some cocaine. While serving time in jail again, Willis met a man in Florida who could supply him with large quantities of Oxy, a highly addictive opioid painkiller that had caused over a million American deaths. After his release, Willis gathered a team and rented a mansion in Pompano Beach, Florida. They purchased thousands of bottles of multivitamins and replaced the vitamins with Oxy, sealing the bottles to appear unopened. This venture brought Willis millions of dollars. Willis's new business of selling Oxy was highly successful, with the pills being shipped up to Cape Cod, where they were sold at a 66% markup. However, this had a negative impact on the people of Massachusetts who became addicted to the opioid. In less than two years, Willis shipped over 260,000 pills and generated over $4 million, although he claims to have made 10 times that amount. 
With his earnings, Willis purchased luxury items such as speedboats, motorcycles, Porsches, Hummers, Bentleys, and even a nightclub and a second mansion. Despite being involved in illegal and morally questionable activities, he was living a lavish lifestyle. Willis had found a partner, a woman named Anne Nguyen, who was 13 years younger than him, and her daughter Mei Lin, whom he loved like his own child. But on Mei Lin's ninth birthday, things took a turn for the worse. Willis could have continued profiting from the opioid crisis if he had kept a low profile, but he didn't. Having amassed wealth, Willis wanted to show it off, which would ultimately lead to his downfall. In 2010, he drove his bright red Hummer to a brothel in Cambridge and came out a few minutes later with a large bag of marijuana. Unfortunately, Willis made a mistake by going to a brothel in Cambridge in his bright red Hummer to buy a large bag of weed. Unbeknownst to him, the FBI was monitoring the owner of the brothel and took notice of Willis's actions. As a result, they started investigating him and began tracking his movements. A few weeks later, he was pulled over by the police for driving without a license and carrying $100,000 in cash. Despite this being a suspicious situation, the FBI did not arrest him as they were building a bigger case against him. After months of investigation, the FBI had built a strong case against him, and the arrest of one of his oxy colliers in Fort Lauderdale was the last piece they needed. On the day of Mei Lin's ninth birthday in March 2011, a team of 40 officers, heavily armed and in body armor, stormed Willis's house and apprehended him. The officers discovered 12,000 oxycodone pills, $480,000 in cash, and 13 firearms during the arrest. Willis, now 42, pled guilty to drug trafficking and money laundering charges and received a 20-year sentence along with forfeiture of his luxury cars, 38-foot speedboat, and $2 million. The investigation also uncovered his involvement in other illegal activities such as gambling, prostitution, and extortion. U.S. Attorney Carmen M. Ortiz called Willis a career criminal and the mastermind behind this organization. The investigation disrupted a significant oxycodone distribution operation which has caused numerous deaths in Massachusetts. In a later interview from prison, Willis reflected on his past struggles and said, Look at me now, I'm sitting in prison. In summary, John Willis's ascent to power in Asian organized crime is both intriguing and intricate. His adaptability, determination, and business savvy allowed him to become a notorious figure in the underworld. Don't miss out on more captivating content like this one. Stay informed and entertained by clicking the subscribe button, and we'll see you in the next video.